The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. A young man named Giovanni Guasconti came very long ago from the more southern region of Italy to pursue his studies at the University of Padua. Giovanni, who had but a scant supply of gold ducats, took lodgings in a high and gloomy chamber of an old edifice of a family long since extinct. One of the ancestors of this family had been pictured by Dante as a partaker of the immortal agonies of his inferno. So begins one of Nathaniel Hawthorne's finest short stories, which is a tale you're about to hear. Unforgettable, not alone as literature, but because it haunts and shocks to the root of the soul. mystery drama, The Kiss of Death, was adapted from the Nathaniel Hawthorne classic short story, especially for the Mystery Theater, by Ian Martin, and stars Kurt Peterson and Patsy Bruder. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Nathaniel Hawthorne described Giovanni as having a remarkable beauty of person, rather a Grecian than an Italian head, with fair, regular features and a glistening of gold among his ringlets. But the story he wove about him was as dark and menacing as his looks were light and open, and the terrible and tortuous fate which lurked in waiting for him was as exquisitely agonizing as any Dante contrived for his lost souls in the seven rings of hell. I did not catch your name, senor, as we boarded the coach. Giovanni Guasconti. Ah, and mine, Salvatore Pergamo. You are young for an occupation. I am a student, sir. And not from our Tuscany? No, sir. From the south, Napoli. Ah, how came you then to Venice? My boat, all the way round the boot. There was no one of my family left, save only an uncle who died and left me a small estate to study with a friend of his in Padua. Ah, you do not go then on to Verona? No, sir. I must find a place to live with as few ducats as I possess and then seek out my uncle's friend who teaches in the medical school. Not by any chance Giacomo Rappaccini? No, I do not know that name. Ah, so much the better for you. It has a large reputation for Italy, but not of the best. Who is your sponsor? Are you a medical man, Signor Pergamo? Un dottore? <laughs> By the faith, no. I am an exporter and importer of goods. It is in the course of the latter half of my business dealings I have run afoul of Dr. Appaccini. Run afoul? I speak too freely to strangers. It is a fault of mine. I say only that Dr. Appaccini has deep and strong interest in potent and very dangerous drugs. Or rather, in plants that produce them. You are a young man of open heart and seeming promise. I am glad you will not be associated with him. Uh, did you uh, tell me your sponsor's name? No. It is Master Pietro Barioni, doctor professor at the university. Hmm. Where do you stay in Padua? I have no idea. Not with the old dottore Baglioni. Oh, no. He was a friend of my uncle's, but only a distant acquaintance of the family. I, I would not have him beholden to me further. Perbacco, I like you, boy. You have a good heart and an ease of manner that bespeaks you well. Here. There is in Padua an old nurse from our family who came into some property in a large house. Here is her address and a note from me. I am sure Dame Elisabetta Falcone will settle you comfortably and within your purse. Had I a son, I cannot think of quarters where you could be better or safer lodged. Si, senor. 
Uh, la dama Elizabeth Falcone. At your service. Uh, to whom have I the honor of speaking? Giovanni Guascanti. I bear an introduction from an old friend, a signor Salvatore Pergamo. Oh, who... il maestro. Uh, oh, mio. Any friend of my little boy. Is... Oh, come in, come in, I beg you. Uh, thank you. Prego. Oh, Salvatore. I was his nurse, you know. Oh, many years ago now. Uh, tell me, how is he? In good health, uh, happy? In the most excellent health, I should say, judging by his girth. Oh. He, he gave me a letter for you, asking you forgive the script. Oh, bless the master. He can never bear to remember that I, who brought him up, can neither read nor write. But his signature and seal, that I recognize. Eh, eh, eh. Signor, would you be good enough to read what the paper says? Eh, let me bring the lantern nearer. Well, it is simple enough. He says, carissima. <laughs> This will serve to introduce a young man of good family and great prospects whose purse is not yet heavy and must find lodging while he attends the university. Uh, I could wish him no better fate than you may find room to take him in. Oh, you could not come with a higher recommendation. Of course, you shall stay here. I followed her up the curving marble staircase. The ceilings and walls finished in great old frescoes. The paint now molding and peeling from the walls. I have a few tradesmen who board on the lower floors. Too damp and musty for the young maestro. Uh, I'm afraid you're not very taken with Padua. I miss the sun. There is a chill here in the bones. Or in the heart. You're homesick. I have no home left. My parents, all my family, are dead. Ah, then, that is enough to dim the sun for anyone. Ecco, signor. <laughs> Magnifico. But can I afford it? Oh, oh, no one else is young enough to climb the stairs. Ah, but you have seen nothing yet. Come, come to the window. How oh, beautiful. And how strange. Oh, surely there is as bright a sunshine as you left in Naples. Bright, uh, though not so warm. What a magnificent garden. Is it not something it's special? Very, a, a botanical garden and so lovingly cared for. Does this belong to the house? Oh, no, senor. No, it's from the villa next door. Such strange, exotic plants. The purples and the, the magentas. I, I don't recognize any of them. No more than I. Observe the gigantic leaves, the huge, heavy blossoms... They're all imported, of course, for the great man who owns them. You see? Oh, that, that, that is he. You, you can see working at one of the beds by the stone urn near the statue. Surely that is no gardener in the scholar's garb of black? Oh, bless us, no. He permits no one else but himself to come near his plants. Uh, that is Dr. Rappaccini himself. Rappaccini? Ah, even in Naples you've heard his name, eh? Huh? No, not in Naples. Uh, more recently. Oh, well, I'm sure he's famous all over Italy. And Europe, and the world, for that matter. So, <laughs> will the room suit you, do you think? Admirably. But, uh, if it will suit my purse. Oh, we shall arrange that when you join us for the evening meal. If you will be my guest. Why, how kind. I, I... Oh, thank me later, young gallant. You may have the more reason. Keep your eye on the garden. There is one flower that adorns it... More beautiful than any you have already seen. The strange, eerie beauty of that garden below held me spellbound. I watched the tall, emaciated figure of the doctor tend his garden, so intent on his ministrations that he was oblivious to all else. Not an herb or a shrub escaped such a scientific and minute examination that it seemed as if he were looking into their innermost nature. And yet, he avoided inhaling their odors or actually touching them and walked among them with a caution that suggested a, a man walking among malignant spirits. Obviously, he, he was not the one who cultivated them. I was just wondering who did when... Beatrice! Beatrice! Here I am, Father. Are you in the garden? Yes. And I need your help. I'll be down in a moment. Now I knew what Dama Falcone had meant when she said I had yet to see the garden's most beautiful flower. For 
brief as the glimpse I had had of her, this was the most radiant, the most vibrantly alive woman I had ever seen in my life. What is it, Father? Our chief treasure. It needs more care than I dare offer in my shattered state. I'm afraid you must take it over as all the others. Gladly. You know how I love them all. But this one... Oh, yes. I am talking to you, my sister. It shall be my task to serve you. And in return, you shall reward me with your perfumed breath, which is the breath of life to me. Never let her languish. She is my greatest triumph. And if truth be told, more than the breath of... What is it, Father? Something wrong? No. Nothing wrong. Come. The hour grows late, and the night air is not kind to my chest these days. Was the sickly, somehow menacing Dr. Rappuccini merely finished with his garden inspection? Or had he somehow spied me in the evening shadows of my lattice window? A bell sounding below took me away from my speculations, and I quickly descended to supper. So... All is settled to your satisfaction, and you desire to take the room? I already feel at home. If the agreed on sum is enough. Oh, more than enough. I promise you I shall not be a roisterer. In fact, I anticipate spending a great deal of time in my room above that magic window. Uh I take it you have already seen its richest bloom. Uh, Yes, just before supper. Uh Signora Falcone... How can I gain an introduction to her? Do you... Oh, the Rappaccinis are far above my head. For all my villas next door, they might live in another world. But surely the great gentleman at the university, Dr. Baglioni, to whom you bear a note of introduction, will will know his fellow doctor. Of course. I shall sleep on the hope of that. (laughs) If indeed, after all that has happened to me today, allows me to sleep. Uh, At your age, sleep comes easily and welcome. When I awoke, I had overslept and was bone-weary from my travels and my new environment. But I was brought to immediate life by the sound of a voice already adored outside my window. Father, must you leave so soon? I have a lecture at the university. Is uh, all well with you here? Of course. I have been tending my, my sister. See how she lifts her head today since I've fed and nourished her. All velvet and sheen and rich and glimmering like the most precious of stones. You breathe a new life on it. As it does on me. You are the richer by far. If either of us are, what would we have without each other? You are lonely, Bellissima. For a little human companionship. Quite right. I must provide you some. But how? We could have a ball or a dinner party. No, no, no. Not in this house, this house, no, no. I know since Mother has gone you have become a recluse, but it is changing. It is time to think of me. I know, and I promise I shall. But it is not a simple matter. I can wait, but not too much longer. I promise you, you shall not have to. I felt guilty eavesdropping from my window... My heart cried out to have Beatrice as my own. And somehow my mind cried out as loudly to forget her, to run, to leave while there was still time. Time for what? And then, suddenly, I realized what was so strange about the garden. All about me, outside it, in in other trees, the birds twittered and swooped and lived their lives. But in the garden of my loved one, no bird lived. And no bird sang. When has any threatened danger held back a man in love? And what danger could lurk in a garden of luxuriant and healthy flowers and shrubs? That Giovanni is about to find out and refuse to believe until the ultimate truth is too undeniable. I shall return shortly with Act Two. There 
is an influence in the light of morning that tends to rectify whatever errors of fantasy or even of judgment we may have incurred during the sun's decline or in the less wholesome glow of moonlight. These are Mr. Hawthorne's words. And what better ones to project that by the following morning, after a good sleep, young Giovanni, looking out his window in the bright sun, found the garden below him a lovely place. It was time to present himself at the university and to meet his sponsor, Il Dottore Baglioni. So, you wish to study medicine, hmm? I wish to provide myself with a livelihood, since my patrimony will soon be exhausted. Oh, frankly spoken again, I like you. I think we might make a doctor of you yet. Report to me tomorrow at the hour of six in the morning. Now, you say you are settled with somewhere to stay? Yes, sir. At La Dama Falcone's house on the Via Eletto. Via Eletto. Via El... Is that near Il Dottore Rappaccini's house? Yes, the very next villa. I have been given to understand he is a man of considerable renown. Uh, yes, the, the name is known. I had gathered more than that. Even famous? Rappaccini. Hmm. A brilliant and amazing man. It is his theory that all medicinal virtues are comprised within those substances we call vegetable poisons. Human life means very little to him. Oh, now and then he achieves a miraculous cure, but in my private mind, these are more probably the work of chance. Well, I must confess, I am only interested in Signor Rappaccini because of his daughter. (laughs) With at least half the young men in Padua, huh? of whom few have ever seen her face. Nay, nephew of my old friend, in this I I am of more hindrance than help. I am afraid an attempted introduction from me to my rival or his daughter would amount to the kiss of death. I beg you to stay away from Rappaccini and his wild obsessions. Too close an acquaintance with him might prove for you what I already jokingly termed myself, the kiss of death. I returned to my lodgings, and on an impulse, I I bought a fresh bouquet of flowers from a florist I passed. Arriving home, I mounted breathlessly to my eyrie and was rewarded to see my enchantress engaged below in the garden. She was in the act of being about to pluck one of the strange exotic flowers from the special plant by the fountain when, on an impulse, I cried out, By your leave, signorina. Who calls me? Giovanni Guscanti, your servant and admirer. Do not pluck that flower. And why not, pray, signor stranger? Because I have here such fresh and lovely and healthful flowers as should adorn such beauty and grace. May I dare to toss them to you and ask you to wear them for my sake? Thus, I thank you, good sir. You speak our language softly and in a different manner from what my ears are used to. Are you from some other land? No. I am Italian, as you, but from the south. You seem quite fair. Unlike the few... uh, Unlike the other young men I have met. I wish we could meet more formally. And so do I. If, if I were to call and, and present my compliments to your father? No. That is not the way. Uh, not yet. But perhaps sometimes we can talk like this. Only it's so far, I, I wish I could show you my garden. I wish I could walk in it with you. At least if we cannot, yet. Let me return your gift by throwing you one special flower. I believe it's too far for you to cast it. Since I've already picked it, at least I can try. Ready? Yes, as high as you can. Oh, I I have it. Oh, no. Don't fall. It had to be one of us, so I let the blossom go. Try again. Not for the world. I would not risk... In the garden, Father. I I shall be in directly. If you should be in your room tomorrow afternoon... Oh, I'm afraid I shall be at my studies at the university. But Mitchie! soon, I hope... 
Tonight there is chill. Come in. Coming? Yes, so do I hope. Soon. And thank you for my flowers. I will guard them and keep them well. Was it some trick of imagination in the half-light after sundown? But as she turned and fled up the garden path, did my eyes deceive me that my lovely bouquet was already withering in her grasp? Huh. What nonsense. I, I tried to tell myself there was no possibility of distinguishing a faded flower from a fresh one at so great a distance. In my hand, where I had touched her flower, burned with a fever of longing. <laughs> It was three days before I had returned to my full senses again, weak from loss of weight and the debilitating effect of some raging poison that had drained my system. I awakened to see Dama Falcone's kind and worried face hovering over my bed. Ah, oh, so we are awake at last and in our senses, eh? Oh, signora, what are you doing in my room? Oh, what have I been doing the last three days under the Dottore Baglioni's orders, but keeping cool compresses on your brow and feeding you gruel to keep body and soul together. Have I been ill then? Oh, with such a raging of the blood that our good Dottore was worried about you till this morning. What caused it? Even he is not sure. There are infectious germs about this time of year. And after your long trip and the shock of losing your family, Dr. Baglioni thinks you fell prey to one of them. Three days... What time is it? Afternoon? Oh, it wants several hours of sunset yet. No, 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 you must not sit up yet till the Dottori returns. Oh, I just want to... Oh, I am weak. Can you see in the garden? Is the Signora Rappuccini there? <laughs> no one without business save the docks have been abroad these days. It has rained as if it were time to start building a second arch. Oh, Dio, that will be the good Dottori back. I must go down and let him in. As soon as she had left the room, I found my way weakly to the window. A gray curtain of rain blurred the empty garden below. I staggered back to my bed, my feet unsteady, my brain reeling. Had I really tossed a bouquet of flowers to Beatrice? And did I remember catching but letting fall the blossoms from the garden she threw me in exchange? Then I blacked out again. Not to come to till I found Dr. Baglioni examining me. Well, 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 well. A fine way to start out learning to be a doctor, my young friend, huh? Will it make you a better physician to begin as a patient? I don't know, sir. Well, not if you start out a dead one. But it seems you will recover. What has ailed me? Some unique humor of the blood. Thanks be to God, you responded well when I bled you. You should be on your feet very soon. When? How soon? Oh, within the week, no doubt, with one as young and as vital as you. Meanwhile, rest and eat well. The good Dama Elisabetta will see that you are fed to regain the weight you have lost. How can I thank you enough for your aid and comfort? It is good to have a friend in a strange city. Ah, more than one. More than one. Surprisingly, someone else today inquired as to your well-being with what appeared to be great personal interest. Who? Dr. Rappaccini. What? I was not aware that you had made his acquaintance... Nor have I. Well, that is welcome news. For if you will follow my advice, you will have as little to do as possible with him. Why do you say that? For some purpose, this man of science is making a study of you. I, I know that look of his. I have seen that cold illumination as he bends over a bird, a mouse, a butterfly, which, in pursuit of some experiment, he has killed... By the perfume of a flower. Now, if you know him not, how should he know you? I... I would only be surmising, and... It is a subject I would rather not pursue. And an acquaintance you had better not either. For, heed me carefully, Signor Giovanni, I would stake my life that if you are not already one of Rappaccini's inhuman experiments... 
You are marked for it. By the next morning, as I awoke refreshed and feeling myself... Buongiorno, signor Guasconti. Buongiorno, Dama Falcone. Oh, out of bed, naughty boy. I bring you your breakfast to eat in bed. Oh, I have it here by the window. <laughs> now, you must eat everything and not allow the attention to wander. Oh, I will eat. I am famished. Oh, for food or for a sight of Rappaccini's daughter? I suppose nothing escapes that sharp eye of yours, Mother Falcone. And <laughs> Not much. Or my ear. Oh, I think I could have told that doctor what ailed you better than he. What? I heard you and the signorina talking from the window. I think you are taken with a disease of the heart, no? Beatrice, yes. <laughs> but it is hopeless, I'm afraid. If, if only I could meet and, and walk with her in the garden. Well, there is a private entrance into the garden from the street. A private entrance to Dr. Rappaccini's garden? Shh, shh, not so loud. Almost any young man in Padua would sell his soul or his birthright to be admitted among those flowers. You may have what little I have if you will show me the way. Oh, Tosh, I want nothing from you. No, I have been well paid already. And here is the key. I give it to you in return for one thing only. What? Name it. You are pale as a ghost and thin as a rail. Manja, senor, so you don't scare the girl half to death. I ate like a lion, dressed in my very best. My blessed guide, Signora Falcone, led me along several obscure passages. Then, suddenly, we were at the door. I thanked her, turned the key easily in the lock, which must have been oiled. I was in Dr. Rappaccini's garden practically under my own window. Welcome, senor. You are not surprised to see me? A connoisseur of flowers such as yourself. After the lovely bouquet you tossed me four days ago, it is no marvel that my father's rare collection has tempted you to take a nearer view. Was it you who sent this key? Why, no. Well, then who? I know not. But does it matter? You are here. Come, I will show you our garden. If fame speaks true, you are as deeply skilled in these rich blossoms and spicy perfumes as your father. Uh, no. Although I have grown up among these flowers, I know no more of them than their hues and their perfumes. Believe me. Oh, there is the flower you tried to toss me by my window. May the good Lord be blessed you failed to grasp it. Why? I, I wanted it very much for a keepsake. Methinks you owe me one. I shall pick it for myself. Oh, no! Touch it not. Not for your very life. It would kill you. Hiding her face, Beatrice rushes from him into the house. And his eyes following her, behold within the shadow of the entrance, the emaciated, ominous figure of the black-clad Dr. Rappaccini. I'll return with Act Three. and shaken by his strange encounter with the girl he loves, Giovanni has stumbled back to his room, suddenly overcome with the debility of his three-day illness, so faint that he is barely able to climb the stairs to his room. Once there, however, no matter how much his fever-weakened body longs for the bed, instinct or some deeper drive forces him to the window. But how could you have given him the key to visit me if you knew there was danger for him? No danger now, my little one. But to think that thoughtlessly, the other day I tossed a blossom from this to him. Had he caught it, what would have happened to him? He would have died. Oh, sweet Mary, forgive me. You were innocent, my love. It would have been but small help to him. Oh, Papa... How can I let him continue to come, even supposing he ever wants to again? Come inside, daughter. This is no place to talk. We may be overheard if he is back in his room. If we are, then I say this. I know he loves me as I love him. But for his sake, 
I think it would be better he stayed away from me. No, 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 no. I have not long to live. And it is time for you to meet with someone. Let me explain just how this may be accomplished in spite of all. I have been studying on this for a long time. And I have come to a conclusion. Behind the drape on my window... I had listened to this conversation between Beatrice and her father. Now as I watched them disappear into the house, I looked down on that fateful, hideous flower that my beloved could fondle and kiss with no harm. Could it be so deadly? The answer was vouchsafed immediately. Crawling across one of the statues was a small chameleon, which in its passage had accidentally brushed against a tendril from the strange shrub. In a second, from the touch of that tendril, the lizard contorted itself in one writhing spasm, and then, as if eaten by invisible fire, crackled like a moth in a candle flame and was gone. I could think no more. I, I, I threw myself on the bed and mercifully passed into darkness. <laughs> Morning, my young friend. Oh, oh. Good morning, Doctor Bacchioni. So, what is this that La Lama Falcone has been telling me about you having a relapse and other things, such as that you have not only talked several times with La Signorina Rapacini, but that you have also gained access to the garden and met her there. Yes, Signor, that is true. I look at you, and physically, you appear to have made a remarkable recovery. This morning, you literally glow with health. It is true. I feel rested and full of life. I'm forced to conclude that perhaps this strange distemper that attacked you is less of the mind than perhaps of the heart. You're right, doctor. Completely right. I am in love with... Beatrice Rappuccini. Oh, I feared as much. With no estate or name and with no prospects but a long term of study before me, you consider my suit as hopeless as I? I consider it hopeless for deeper reasons. I think you must have some suspicions of the truth already. Very well. I've been too late to stop Rappuccini's experiment with his daughter, but at least I can try to stop him from whatever new experiment he plans for you. For me? What interest could he have in me? I, I haven't even met the man. Well, where do you think the key came from that admitted you to the garden? From Beatrice. Who else? From Rappuccini. Ask the Dama Falcone if you don't believe me. It was placed in her hands by the doctor himself, along with a golden ducat to make sure she brought it to you. But why? I, I don't understand. Who, who can penetrate the clouded workings of this, this tortured mind? A man who would sacrifice his own daughter to his own obsession. Is there nothing we can do for her? I, I would gladly give my life. Let us not be too hasty. There may be a way to outwit Rappuccini yet. How? You see this little silver flask? It was wrought by the hands of the great Cellini. It must be priceless. Ah, yes, yes. But most of all, because of what it contains, one sip of the antidote in it would render all the poisons of the Borgias innocuous. Bestow it on your Beatrice... And we will thwart Rappuccini yet. Once my dear old friend had left, I hastened to dress. My heart buoyed with the hope that the silver flask would make all well. And then came the ultimate blow. A small bird had crashed against the pane of my open window and dropped to the ledge. I went to the poor little creature, lifting it and, and finding it still alive and only momentarily stunned. Soothingly, I brought it to my lips, touching them to its head, about to make a, a sound of reassurance. But to my horror, like, like the chameleon in the garden the day before, the touch of my lips galvanized it into one agonizing spasm, and then it dissolved into nothingness in my hands. At the same moment, the voice of Beatrice called me from the garden. Giovanni! Giovanni, are you there? What do you want of me now, accursed, poisonous witch? Oh, no! Come down to the garden. 
Let me try to explain. No need for explanations anymore. I am the only being your breath cannot slay. Your kiss may never kill. I stumbled from my room for the door and, and for the garden. I was a mass of conflicting emotions. Love, hate, despair, and murderous fury as I faced Beatrice in that deadly garden. How can you pretend ignorance? Shall I prove the power I have gained from the pure daughter of Rappuccini? No, no. No proof is necessary. So you admit you have cast your poisonous spell on me. You saw what happened to the bird on the window? I saw. But it is not me. Believe me. It is my father's fatal science. How could you have not known? How could I have known? Locked up a prisoner all these years in this garden. My only companions, my father and the flowers. Particularly this evil thing of beauty that I pretended was a sister. Because I had no human being to share my love and friendship with. You must have known. You had to know. Yesterday when I reached for the blossom on this venomous vine, you cried out, touch it not. It will kill you. I did cry that out. And yet, a few days earlier, when I brought you flowers, you tossed the same blossom to me at my window. Luckily, that had only grazed my fingers, for that touch alone was enough to put me in a flush, a fever that nearly killed me. I knew nothing of that. Where did you think I was? If I had been myself for all the love I had in my heart for you, don't you think I would have been daily at your window? I thought you were at the university studying as you told me you would be. Of course. All innocence. And having failed to dispatch me from a distance, you had to provide me entry to the garden to make sure to... Oh, oh dear. Forgive me, I... I, I don't know what I'm saying. It, it was you who saved my life. A life that, believe me, I never had dreamed stood in any danger from me or mine. Your life was the most precious thing in the world to me. And because of it, I had to drive you from me. Why? I was in no danger. Don't you see? I knew nothing till after my father had given you the key. Even then, the one thing he told me was that you must not touch this flower upon pain of death. I was so lonely for you. I loved you so. I wanted only to spend a little time alone with you. I had forgot the flower when you were near, and all the world seemed lovely. Before I knew that I was something hateful and poisonous, sister to that deadly flower. Where did it come from? My father created it. Created it? He knows all the vile secrets of nature. At the very hour when I first drew breath, this plant sprung from the soil, the offspring of his science, his intellect, while I was only his earthly child. But I grew up and was nourished by it. I thought of it as my sister, not as my doom. Not only yours, but mine. Look. No, you you see, I picked the flower, and it is as harmless to me now as you. I have put my curse on what I love best. No curse, my daughter. Dr. Rappuccini. No curse. You made us both unclean. Unclean? Look at you. One step below gods, both of you, and I created you. Feel the power that courses through your veins. The magic gift my arts have brought you. You could quell the mightiest enemy with a breath. Shrivel the most monstrous onslaught against you with a touch. What more could you ask than to be as near immortal as man or woman may reach? I would have chosen to be loved, not feared. I am condemned forever to what I am. Our fate is not so desperate, thanks to my friend, Dr. Baglioni. Baglioni? That bumbling bigot! In this flask, Beatrice, is an antidote distilled of blessed herbs which can purify us. Then let us drink. No! I warn you. Drink of that flask and it can bring you only death. So powerful as the poisons you have thrived on, as powerful is that antidote. No human body could stand the conflict. Don't listen to him, Beatrice. Drink, and I will follow. Stop! I will not let you destroy my triumphs. I will shoot you first. He has a pistol. You will have to shoot me first, Father. If 
get this to be our portion, then let it be for all evil. What are you doing? Uprooting forever this venomous vine. Take it to your own bosom, where it belongs. I am undone. Oh, I did not mean to cause his death. I, I thought he was immune. No. My father was immune to nothing except love. And forgive him. He is better off dead. Now, quick, let us drink. It, it may mean death. You heard Dr. Rappuccini. I will not live as I am. Nor I. Then give it to me. I shall drink first. No. I shall pour half in the cap of the flask. The flask is for you. To the future, Giovanni. To our future. Whatever it may be. What future did these lovers find? Were they star-crossed as Romeo and Juliet? Or did the gods smile on them like Elizabeth and Robert Browning? Well, what does it matter, after all, if they were together? A good story doesn't always need an end. At least, none beyond that the listener chooses to select. Believe for himself. I'll be back shortly. I hear some murmurs of dissatisfaction with the ending. Then let us make a confession. The story, as you have heard it, does not end exactly as Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote it. If you must have an ending to this dark tale, you can read his solution. We can only say we thought poor Beatrice and her unlucky lover Giovanni deserved a better fate, dead or alive. And we left it to you to choose. Our cast included Kurt Peterson, Patsy Bruder, Arnold Moss, Bryna Rayburn, and Gilbert Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs> 